and let's dive in to workshop one, Farm to Grocery, and we'll be focusing on legality and an overview um, as our first workshop in a series of three. So today our inventory um, is looking at, uh, starting with an introduction, moving on to Farm to Grocery and the overview. Uh, we have our guest speaker, Jane Jewett, who's going to help out with legality. We'll have a discussion and closing questions. So introduction, these are our facilitators who have agreed graciously to help us out when we are going to be doing some small group breakout uh, by regions of the state. Uh, so thank you, um, Kathy, David, Greg, Alma, and Shannon. Um, they're, they'll introduce themselves in their um, breakout rooms, but I greatly appreciate uh, all of, all of y'all helping out. So this workshop um, is hosted through the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. And the partnerships are made up of five regions um, in greater Minnesota that have regional directors. As you can see, they're smiling faces here. And I, I think, I know at least one, if not, I saw an, another regional director joining. I think we have Anne here as well. Um, and the, the regions are, um, the regional directors answer to board of directors um, and also work groups. And those work groups focus on clean energy, resilient communities, agriculture and food systems, and natural resources. And so it's really about making uh, connections and community-driven projects and connecting that with the university. And so just a, a short intro to the partnerships as we, as we call them. And this workshop is also done in partnership with the Sustainable Farming Association. So um, we're great, part, great thankful for, for the partner uh, of, of them. And then also with support from a specialty crop block grant through the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and support from the Arrowhead Economic Opportunity Agency and the Rutabaga Project. So uh, we have a little interactive uh, activity here just quickly. Um, I'm gonna ask you where you're located in a couple slides. This is telling you how to do what I'm asking. So on the top, you should say you are viewing my screen, Renault's screen. And then next to that is a view options. So if you click on view options, there'll be a drop down menu that says annotate. So hopefully folks, I see a couple of people nodding are able to find that. And then this bar should pop up once you click on annotate. Uh, and I invite you to, to click on the stamp and then the, there's a bunch of symbols that pop up. So feel free to click any one of those symbols. And so then you can go ahead and put a symbol by using that annotate function of where you're joining us from. All right, I see folks jumping in already. Look at that distribution around the state. All right, we'll have, there's a couple more, oh, I see, yep, we have a, a few people from outside of the state as well. Few more people joining us. I see some dots and stars and hearts. All right. Thanks everyone for uh, doing that. I'm just gonna grab a quick uh, shot of this and there we go. I will clear it off now. Thanks for participating. Oh, we have one more <laughs> and clear it again. All right. So you might be wondering what you signed up for. Uh, well, obviously this is a workshop on farm to grocery. So hopefully you're in the right place. Uh, there'll be three Zoom sessions, some reading, watching, processing on your own. Networking, we'll be sending out a list of participants. And if you would like to not be on that list, um, go ahead and um, you can send a note to Anna or me in the chat. Um, and we'll make that uh, note, or you can also send it to the email that had all of the information about this, this uh, workshop. Some relationship building hopefully happening in our small group breakouts uh, and your participation and questions and curiosities and also experience. Uh, we wanna learn from you as well. So uh, before uh, we, when we did the, um, uh, message that was sent out to everyone uh, prior to the workshop, uh, we asked you to share some of your 
um, shared agreements. And so shared agreements are a set of way, a guideline, a way of being with each other to understand um, how to interact and, and to connect during this workshop series. And so I'll pull that um, shared agreements. Can everyone see the shared agreement slide now or screen now? If you want to nod or yep. Yep. All I right. So. Just want to check when I transitioned between things. So um, thank you for sharing some of these. We have um, speak from the I perspective, act with tact, empathy, curiosity, humility, respect silence, don't force yourself to fill silence. Silence can be an indication of thought and process. Um, share, even if you don't have the right word, suspend judgment and allow others to be unpolished in their speaking. If you are unsure of their meaning, then ask for clarification. Allow people to express experiences in their own way. Um, I do not need to fix things or control the content. Oops and ouch, say oops if you did, if you said something you didn't mean to and ouch if you hear something offensive or hurtful. Um, so yeah, thank you again for uh, typing in some of those and you can, the link was sent out. Um, it's, uh, excuse me, available through the, the Google site, um, which was sent out to everyone prior. Um, so thanks for participating in that. And just as we move through this workshop, have a few of those in mind and, and how we're connecting with each other. Here we go. So our objectives for this workshop are to engage and connect with other participants through a welcoming and comfortable space and to gain an understanding of the legality of local food and identify specific benefits and barriers for both grocers and farmers. So now we'll go into our breakout rooms um, and we'll invite you to share your name and pronouns if you'd like, your location, the business name and your role and your favorite group to food to grow, make, or sell. So Anna, if you want to help us out with that. And before we go in there, I will put in the chat um, to everyone those questions. So, uh, so we have the, the building a strong business relationship, the farm feature template, a processing for sale, sample product labels, and the invoice template. Um, and this was done, uh, Jane Jewett, who's, who's going to be speaking to the legality later, um, and Kathy and Greg helped out and a number of different people it was re reviewed by um, a couple of farmers as well to get some input. Um, so just some, some background on the toolkit itself. So why farm to grocery and why spend time talking about this, this market? Um, there's consumer demand. Uh, this market is considered a moralized market, which means there's economic activities that align with values. And so um, there's definitely a push from consumers um, for this market uh, because of those values. There's the potential to support resilient local economies um, when multiple businesses within a community are connecting with each other, um, there's more resiliency that can be built up and that money stays local. Um, also thinking about supply chain disruptions and um, what we've seen um, happen in terms of COVID um, on a national, there's it hasn't been as, as wild as it could have been, but still thinking about keeping things local, you have more control over that supply chain. And for farmers, adding, a mar adding this market into your mix can um, add diversification um, and different options throughout the season. And grocers, there's definitely sales opportunities for you um, when it comes to this market because there's that consumer demand. Um, and we've learned that through the surveying that we did um, with the, the rural grocery survey, which I'll get to in a second. Um, this kind of bullseye target that you see, you may have seen this before. Um, this is um, tiers of the food system, starting with personal production of food and that zero in the very middle, moving out to direct producer to consumer, um, which thinking about farmers markets, farm stands, CSAs. And then moving to tier two, strategic partners in supply chain relationships, that's more of the food co-ops, grocery stores, um, that kind of, of scale is what we're looking at here today. And then um, we're taking one step back even more, um, looking at larger volume aggregation and then the global um, food system. So here's just a snip. I, I just typed in um, local food and grocery in, in Google and found this Shoppers want local food, but grocers aren't providing the goods. Um, so there's definitely opportunity here that we've also seen in the survey um, that we did. And so for folks that attended, I know we have a number of people that signed up from the Sustainable Farming Association Conference. 
Um, these, this is kind of a high level findings that we, you may have also heard um, there, but not everyone was part of that conference. So that's why we're presenting it again. So this survey was mailed to 250 grocers in towns less than 2,500. That's the USDA definition of rural. And that's what we wanted to focus um, looking at greater Minnesota. There was a 55% response rate. And part of this, we included a comment card that asked grocers to connect with different ways from the survey to us at extension. And one of those ways was helping, was checking this, I would like help connecting with local farmers to buy products. And so we saw that 58%, so there were 81 people that checked those, that filled out the comment card in addition, separate from the survey. And 58% said that they would like help connecting with farmers. So there is definitely interest um, that we saw from that comment card. And here's the distribution of those grocery stores. Um, again, in communities less than 2,500 is what we're looking at here um, that said they would, wanted to connect directly with grocers. And so some of these stores may even be on this call today. Um, 40 overall from the survey results, 41% um, of rural grocers would like more access to local foods. And we know from their, re their responses that their you know, consumers are maybe interested, their customers are maybe interested in paying more. So we asked that, would they be willing? 11% said, yes, I am absolutely willing. 54% um, said maybe, and 35% said no. Uh, so there's definitely some potential there uh, in terms of consumers interested um, at these small stores, um, independent grocery stores mostly. Uh, we asked them if they turned away any farmers selling locally grown and or processed foods because they were uncertain about the regulations. Um, and 29% said yes, uh, that they had turned away farmers from their grocery store because they weren't sure if it was legal or what the regulations were around that. And so that's one of the reasons why we're spending time on this workshop and other outreach that we do um, connecting on the legality of it. And here's a quote um, that you can see uh, I would like to be able to sell locally raised food and we have access to such, but regulations make that difficult for us to do. So really addressing this, um, this legality piece in the regulations. Um, we asked them which of the following they buy directly from farmers, fresh fruits and vegetables, honey um, and shell eggs are the top responses, but vegetables was by and far the largest that's currently being bought at, at small town grocery stores. And we also asked them what type of products would they like to buy more of? Um, and jams and jellies was the top one, um, in addition to fruits, vegetables, syrups, meats, eggs, and then honey on the bottom. So looking specifically at produce um, purchased directly from farmers, uh, these are the different barriers that grocers responded to. And the number one for this um, set of data was the having a sufficient supply of local produce to sell, um, then maintaining shelf life, and then understanding rules and regulations are kind of the top three. We asked them the greatest barrier to selling locally grown fresh produce. And that was, again, understanding the rules and regulations for selling local produce. So that legality piece. So thinking about the survey um, and then we'll, stepping, we'll step broad, more broadly farm to grocery um, now. So uh, one of the things that we want to talk about are some considerations when thinking about this market. Um, so being prepared, and this mirrors um, the toolkit as well, I think like the, the uh, maybe third or fourth page, um, looking at products that are, are shelf ready. Um, we'll talk more specifically on products on marketing and merchandising in workshop three. Um, but, you know, looking at for farmers, um, things that might be, you know, unique and, 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 and grocers understanding what, pro what products um, might be, something that you could replace with local or in companionship with local foods. Um, thinking about prices and considering um, this topic, again, we'll talk more in workshop two and more so in three on pricing. And this is uh, a question that we've got um, when folks registered is interest in talking about pricing. And this is a, can be a really sticky, you know, um, it can be a challenge, but it doesn't need to be. So I think for farmers, knowing the cost of your production and really what it takes um, to, to get that product um, from field to the grocery store. Uh, and then grocers, on the other hand, consider the price you're willing to pay for local products and understanding that um, it's, you know, the, the cost is gonna be different than what it is in whole, in, at a wholesale level. And 
that can be a challenge, um, but I think it's something that's worth having a conversation about and meeting kind of in the middle or wherever um, when building that relationship between farmers and grocers. Um, again, we'll dive more in depth on that um, in a later workshop. Um, being prepared in terms of legality, we're covering that today. Um, and thinking about the size of the store that you're approaching if you're a farmer um, or if you're a grocer, kind of the size of the farm, or are you working with multiple farms in your community? Um, and so um, just some, some considerations for being prepared. Moving on to approaching them, um, off season or slower store hours are, um, are, are good ways to, to have, start having these conversations. And in workshop two, we'll hear from a grocer and a farmer on their experiences with farm to grocery. Um, so they might have some more insight on this. Um, phone calls versus in-store. Um, grocers can be really busy, just like farmers can be really busy. Um, so thinking about you know, that in-person face-to-face, is that gonna be, be more beneficial in the relationship initially? Um, or do people, they prefer to talk via phone call? Um, and then this is COVID too, so making sure you're being safe um, when, when having these meetings. Um, farmers highlighting your product, bringing samples if possible, uh, and really you know, having some pride in that because of what you're producing, um, it can, can also be um, something that the grocer, if they see you have pride in your product, then you know, having grocer might have some more confidence. Uh, and then use of the toolkit during the conversation in, in workshop two, we'll talk more about specific questions to consider. Finally, keeping records. Um, farmers, um, if you don't have a farm food safety plan, um, maybe this is something you can think about. Uh, and if you do, great. Um, the University of Minnesota Extension on Farm Food Safety Program has templates available and I can always connect you if you have more questions on that later. Um, keeping food safety records. Notes from conversations between um, when you're in the store or when you're taking calls, it's always good to keep notes. And then invoices, and I've, I've heard it recommended to consider two signed copies um, when you're, especially if you're just starting out to make sure that everyone has um, records available. Um, so I wanna ha have us break out into breakout rooms. Hopefully it'll be as seamless as it was at the start. Um, these are the questions that I have um, that we'll discuss. Uh, why are you personally interested in farm to grocery? And what other challenges or benefits do you see for participating in farm to grocery or have you experienced? And I'll stick those questions in the chat so everyone has them. Um, and Anna, if you want to go ahead and open up the breakout rooms. Great. So hopefully you're able to have um, some discussion about um, why, you're, why you're personally interested or what are the challenges and benefits um, of farm to grocery within your region. And we're not going to report out back on this, um, but I can share, I'll, I'll post the notes that were taken um, to the Google site that was sent in the link and I'll resend that link um, so that folks have access to those, those notes and those comments. So thank you all for participating in that. So we are gonna um, move on to legality um, in our inventory. And um, in legality, we will be covering um, with our guest speaker, Jane Jewett, uh, fresh produce, grains, meat and poultry, eggs, dairy, and then we'll discuss value added at length um, such as processed produce, off-farm ingredients, and what that means, um, juice, and bakery. And you can follow along if you'd like, um, or uh, not necessary either, because we'll have the information on the screen. Um, but this is starting at page six, if you have your the toolkit, and we'll kick it off with fresh produce. And I will start us off with, first, I should say, before we do fresh produce, there's a couple of legality broad concepts. Um, and that is the first one that's important to know is what's considered product of the farm. Um, and this is a concept written into the Minnesota Constitution and in the Minnesota statute. And basically this means product of the farm, that these are products grown and raised on land that's occupied and cultivated by a farmer or gardener. Um, and the land can be owned or rented or leased. Um, so that's the first concept to, to have. Um, and the second concept is sell or sale. Um, and it has a, sp a specific definition that's a little lengthy, as you can see here in Minnesota statute. Um, sell and sale mean keeping, offering, or exposing for sale, use, transporting, transferring, negotiating, soliciting, or exchanging food. 
Um, and then having possession with intent to sell, use, transport, negotiate, solicit, or exchange food, storing, manufacturing, producing, processing, packaging, or packing, excuse me, and holding food for sale. Um, so just wanted to get kind of our mindset of product for farm and sell slash sale. So we're on the same page there. Um, and then I want to note too that the products outlined here are focused on selling to grocery stores. So we're not talking about cottage foods or we're not talking about direct to consumer because there are different um, rules and regulations. The legality is different um, when talking about that. And so if you're interested in, in kind of those other um, concepts of selling to direct consumer or um, to other, other things that are not grocery stores, uh, we invite you to check out this Blazing Trails training. Um, and the recording of, of the training it will be available on the MISA website. They had um, a series of them in, um, posted over Zoom uh, and Jane uh, Jewett was helping lead that. And again, this PowerPoint and the recording will be available on the the, the workshop Google site. So no worries if you don't get these links down right now, they, you will have access to them later. So fresh produce, um, when thinking about fresh produce and um, product of the farm, um, it really think, really um, kind of the conversation goes to the scale of the farm and what size the farm is in terms of legality. Um, food safety overall, um, you know, you can't be um, selling adulterated food that we need to, farmers um, and the farmers that I've worked with, I mean, there, there's a lot of pride that goes into that production and food safety is part of that. Um, we have in the toolkit, a uh, uh, farm food safety uh, template that you can take advantage of. Um, if you don't already have one, this can just be a summary and that's available on um, page 12. Uh, you can see a screenshot of it here. Um, the farm food safety plan um, can be something that you can promote your farm with if you're a fruit and vegetable farm. Um, the municipal, like I mentioned earlier, the University of Minnesota Extension on Farm Food Safety Program has um, templates available and are willing to work with with produce farmers um, on the on that template or on the on their their um, farm food safety plan. So then the next consideration is the Food Safety Modernization Act produce safety rule. Um, and this produce safety rule sets a minimum, new minimum standards for safe growing, harvesting, packaging, packing, and holding of produce grown for human consumption. Um, there are kind of three um, tiers that farmers can fall into based upon who they're selling their product to and how much um, revenue um, or, or dollar amount is being sold. Um, so the first one is excluded and not covered. And so these are generally you know, small size farms. Um, the second is eligible for an exemption. And um, I think the majority of farms are either small or eligible for ex exemption in Minnesota. Um, and so if, if the farm is eligible for an exemption, that means that they need to display at the point of sale, the complete business, ad business address and business name. Um, so that, that's why I have signage included there. And then if they're covered, that means that they are following um, larger, um, uh, uh, practices um, that they have to document and record, make, make records of worker training, water quality management, cleaning and sanitizing. And so this FISMA is what it's called, Food Safety, Safety Modernization Act. There are day long courses that farmers take to, um, to be um, in compliance with the rule or if they're eligible for an exemption or not covered, then they don't need to follow this rule. So it's something if you're a grocer, you know, thinking about the produce safety rule, um, it's not, it's not a, a big and scary. It's, it's doable. There's a lot to it though. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it's something that ensuring uh, the safe safety of, of fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, so the Minnesota, uh, Department of Agriculture Produce Safety Program has lots of information. Um, and if you're a farmer and you're just hearing this and you're thinking, I don't know, I mean, I, I just, I only sell produce at the farmer's market. I don't know if I'm eligible or excluded. Um, the Minnesota Produce Safety Program website has direct contact for them and they will um, help you understand if you're covered or not. And so then finally, uh, the last consideration for fresh produce when selling to grocery stores, um, grocers may have heard and farmers uh, may have heard of what's called a gap audit or good agricultural practice practices. Um, and so that's when a third party auditor comes out to the farm and um, does a specific audit on 
like either, you know, one type of produce or if they're in production, there's multiple types that they can do in a day. It depends on um, the buyer usually is the one. So if there's a large wholesaler um, and they're working with a larger scale farmer, they might ask, they will probably ask for a gap audit. Um, but this is something that's not required to sell to a, a grocery store. Um, it's something that's um, elective and it, the audit goes into depth on practices and, and looks at the farm on production and harvesting and cleaning and all that kind of stuff, um, processing. Um, so that's not required um, for selling to grocery stores, um, but I just wanted to, to, to tell you about that. Um, fresh produce um, traceability labeling is, is um, something that's talked about with the produce safety rule training, and it um, basically means one step forward, one step back, uh, having traceability at each link in the food chain. Um, so on farms, this means understanding um, where the field location and the date of uh, like what day it was harvested um, might be, are good things to include on the produce itself or with, with the produce. So, um, I, lot, so lot, it's basically called a lot code um, and it can be numbers or letters. I can be written in, sh in Sharpie or there some farms have stickers or stamps or things like that that they'll use. Um, so just in, in, in increasing the, the traceability of the, the local food um, that's being produced. Um, so one, one step forward, one step back is traceability. Um, fresh produce. Uh, making produce presentable for sale is not processing. So product of the farm, if that produce has not been um, added any off-farm ingredients um, or it's not been aggregated with other farm products, it's just that one farmer's product, that's remember product of the farm. Um, so making produce presentable for sale is not processing. So farmers can wash, trim roots and tops. Um, they can um, trim outer leaves uh, using potable um, drinking water on their farm. Um, and so also to note too, that sometimes leaving outer leaves can extend shelf life and trimming can happen at the store. If you're talking, you know, with the, the buyer, um, that might be an option uh, to, you know, make sure that the quality is, is, is as high quality as possible. Um, or sometimes leaving greens on tops can reduce shelf life as well. So it's really thinking about the product and what's best um, for the product and those involved. Um, there's more resources available, selling Minnesota produce, and then uh, selling or serving locally grown produce in food facilities. And these are available at the MISA website. Um, you can check them out. And they're re also referenced in the toolkit as well. So these go um, much, much deeper. Grains and dry beans. So moving on, uh, and we ha will have a opportunity for questions and answers. Um, Oh, I hit someone's. <laughs> uh, as as we uh, move through this, um, I'll just cover grains and dry beans quickly. So packaged, labeled with the name of the product, uh, list of ingredients, net weight, name and address of the farm, and allergen labeling are items to to um, include on the package label. Um, farmers must do cleaning and package packaging in an adequate facility. This can be at their farm or off their farm, but it cannot be a home kitchen. And so a food handler's license through the Minnesota Department of Ag comes into play when you're adding off-farm ingredients or sourcing product from other farmers. Um, so that's key. So without adding off-farm ingredients or sourcing product from other farmers, it's considered product of the farm. And Jane, I will pass it off to you um, if you want to unmute yourself and take on meat and poultry sure. next. Okay, yeah, thanks, Ren. Um, before we dive into meat and poultry, which can get really complicated, does anybody have questions about produce or grains and dry beans? You can feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Um, okay, I'm not seeing any, so if they come in chat, we can grab them later. Okay, meat and poultry. Uh, locally grown meat and poultry are legal for grocery stores to buy, but they have to be processed under USDA or Minnesota equal to inspection. And that 
means slaughtered and processed under inspection. And, um, and that means that there's an inspector at the plant on every day of ap operations looking at every animal before it's slaughtered and after it's slaughtered to verify that it's healthy. So um, there are a lot of small processing plants all over Minnesota that, that the plant itself is inspected up to four times a year, but they do not have an inspector present on every day of operation. And those plants cannot supply meat to grocery stores. So for grocery stores to buy local meat, the farmer has to get that animal to one of these plants that has continuous, which means every day, inspection. Uh, and there are USDA plants and there are Minnesota equal to plants. And the Minnesota equal to plants are equal to USDA for every purpose as long as it stays within the Minnesota state borders. So uh, if an animal is being raised in Minnesota, processed at an equal to plant and sold to a grocery store in Minnesota, that is all totally legal. Um, the meat packages that come from animals slaughtered and processed under inspection are going to be marked with a mark of inspection. And for the USDA plants, those are those circles there. The one all the way on the left has a, a letter P at the bottom next to the plant number. That indicates poultry. And then the middle one is a USDA establishment mark of inspection for red meat. And then the Minnesota state outline on the right is um, it's used across the board for any animal processed at an equal to plant. Um, so the farmer who brings product into one of these plants with continuous inspection is going to provide their farm name to that plant. And the processing plant is uh, typically will incorporate that farm name um, into the labeling that the plant puts on the package. Okay, and so then there's this funny area of historically wild game, animals like bison, elk, deer, rabbit, uh, things that were historically wild game, the USDA says that those are not amenable to inspection. The state of Minnesota has the option to be stricter than federal and the state of Minnesota says, yeah, if those things are raised on farms, uh, we say they're meat, just like any domestic livestock is meat. So Minnesota requires inspection. So if these animals are being sold to a grocery store in Minnesota, they also must be inspected. If they're inspected at a USDA plant, it's considered voluntary inspection by the USDA. So they get this triangle symbol stamped on the package uh, and the farmer is, is charged for that inspection because USDA considers it voluntary. If those animals are processed at a Minnesota equal to plant under inspection, they'll get that same little state of Minnesota outline stamped on the package and um, the plant will not be charging the farmer for the inspection itself because Minnesota says it's mandatory. Although the plants can have some additional charges, but um, the, the bottom line for grocery stores is that if there's either a USDA mark of inspection, either the circles or the triangle or a Minnesota state equal to mark of inspection, that little outline of the state of Minnesota. If you're a grocery store in Minnesota, either of those are legal for you to buy and resell. Um, and Ren has hit a couple times on this uh, definition of product of the farm. So if no off-farm ingredients are added to the meat, if it's a beef animal, for instance, and everything being made at the inspected plant is um, a muscle cut or ground beef or something uh, like soup bones and no off-farm ingredients are added to that, the farmer does not need a license to sell it. So the farmer can take that product with that mark of inspection on it 
to a grocery store and uh, the farmer does not need a license to do that. If the farmer is having off farm ingredients added, which is more common with pork products. So if the farmer is getting pigs made into sausage or bacon or ham, where the plant is adding those off farm seasonings or cures, uh, then that is addition of off farm ingredients. And so the farmer needs a food handler license from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture in order to sell those products. But with that license, the farmer can still sell those products to a grocery store for the store to resell. Um, and then there are requirements to maintain temperature during storage and transport. So for fresh unfrozen product, that would be 41 degrees Fahrenheit and for a frozen product to zero degrees or lower. So we do have more publications with uh, exhaustive detail about selling Minnesota meat and poultry products uh, and a complimentary Minnesota Department of Agriculture publication about approved sources for meat and poultry for food facilities to buy and food facilities would include grocery stores. So those are available on that same local food fact sheet series webpage. Um, any questions about meat or poultry before we move on? Ren, were there some things in the chat? There's one question we have. Um, what is the easiest way to get an MDA manufacturer's license, um, food handler's license? The easiest way to get one. Oh, well, the only way to get one is to... Uh, work with an inspector from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture to, to get your license. So licenses are always accompanied by inspections by an inspector. Um, and what you wanna do to just start out is go on the Minnesota Department of Agriculture website um, and find the, the food licensing liaison request. So if you go under um, food, the food tab on the Department of Ag and look for that food licensing liaison and start there with filling out the little request form and then you get contact from the licensing liaison who finds out where you're located and what you want to do and um, refers you on to the correct inspector. But yeah, getting in touch with an inspector is what you absolutely have to do in order to get a license of any kind. And uh, any other questions? That's the only one I saw in the chat. Okay, moving on to eggs then. Um, shell eggs are considered product of the farm when they're sold by the farmer who raised them. And uh, there is a registration form for small flock egg producers. A small flock is considered fewer than 3,000 hens. So if you are raising fewer than 3,000 hens for eggs, um, you're a small flock producer and there's this voluntary registration form that the Minnesota Department of Ag asks you to fill out and file with them to, um, to say that you're going to be selling eggs from your farm. There's no charge for it. It's one page. It's, it's basically just so they have a record of who's selling eggs. And uh, that can actually be a useful um, thing. It's documentation that this farmer is registered and known to the MDA. Uh, the farmer gets a certificate back and that's something that a farmer can show a grocery store to verify that you know, the farmer is taking this level of responsibility to do that registration. Uh, farmers can sell their own eggs as product to the farm. If someone is aggregating eggs from other farmers, from multiple farmers, uh, that can also be done, but there's licensing required for that. So anytime you step outside of selling your own production from your own flock and you want to carry eggs from other farmers, then there's licensing. 
Uh, cleaning eggs is a challenge at, at a small scale. Uh, wet washing of eggs is possible, but there is no immersion allowed. So putting a bunch of eggs in a bucket and letting them soak is totally off the table. You cannot do that. Um, there are some techniques for doing a no immersion, uh, no immersion wash. And we have more information about that on the MISA website as well. So for sales to grocery stores, there are requirements uh, that come down from the federal level for candling, grading, packing, and labeling of eggs. And those are gone into in great detail in the uh, Selling Minnesota Shell Eggs fact sheet. Um, basically, you know, you're required to candle the eggs, which means holding them up to a light source in a darkened room to check for cracks and check for grade, which grade is the size of the air pocket between the egg contents and the shell, and it's an indicator of freshness. Um, and then packing into cartons or flats, uh, labeling with the pack date, which is the date when you did all that candling and grading, and the freshness date, which is 30 days out from the pack date. Uh, and then the safe handling instructions, because eggs are a potentially hazardous product that should not be consumed raw. So safe handling instructions to remind people to cook them. Those are all required uh, for, for eggs to be sold out in the public eye. And here's an example of an egg carton label. So um, there, are, there are a bunch of different configurations that could potentially happen. Like a grocery store could receive eggs from a farmer that are packaged and labeled with the farm's um, name and address and all of these required components of the label. And so a grocery store could take those eggs packaged that way and put them on the shelves. And the grocery store already has a retail food handler license, so everything's good. Uh, if the store wishes to take in bulk eggs from multiple farmers and do their own uh, candling, grading, packing, and labeling in the back room, uh, grocery stores could also do that, but then the store would have to be uh, licensed as an egg handler. It's an additional like endorsement on their food handler license. So the store would have to get that egg handler license um, and then the store could do their own candling grading packing. Okay, so again, that same publications page, the local food fact sheet series, there's the uh, Selling Minnesota Shell Eggs fact sheet. The Selling Minnesota series is really geared towards the farmers and describes all the ways that farmers can sell their product. And then the, the ones coming from the Department of Ag side, the sale of locally raised eggs to food facilities, um, that's geared towards the buyers to explain what what uh, egg products the buyers, the stores, the restaurants, and so forth can legally buy. And Jane, before we go on, um, there's a question that came in um, about thinking back to the meat. Um, does feed supplements and purchase soybeans or minerals, salt, etc., constitute off-farm ingredients in meat production? So feed supplements. Oh, no, anything that you feed the animals that you may buy in um, has no bearing on, on whether the meat product is considered product of the farm. The product of the farm designation is for the meat product. And so if you're adding salt or spices um, or a cure to the meat product, that's what would take it out of product of the farm. What the animal is fed has has no bearing on product of the farm status of the meat. Um, and then there's one more question. Is there a pre-inspection checklist to follow before contacting an inspector? 
you know of? Um, yes, there, the Department of Ag has some online um, checklists. They're not super specific. Uh, you know, the main thing is to have all of your business information ready to hand, like your, your name, your address, um, you know, what you grow. It's, it's surprising how many people fumble for that information when they're asked it. So, you know, just having the really basic information about who you are, where you are, what you do in front of you, and then um, as best you can explain what you want to do, because all of the questions the inspector is going to ask you are going to center around, you know, what you're producing, uh, how you're handling it, who you're selling it to where you're selling it. So who you're selling it to is, is pretty important because um, retail sales to the end consumers, the people who are using it themselves in their household, that's one track for licensing. And then sales to grocery stores or schools or restaurants or others who will um, resell that product or serve it, um, those intermediaries uh, that's the wholesale track and that's the different tracks. So, so that kind of, you know, just basic information about who you are, where you are and what you intend to do is what you should have in front of you. Um, and then there's one more question. I'm guessing this is in relation to the eggs because it came in right after that. Um, any advice for packaging that includes a variety of sizes, colors, assuming, assuming all same grade? So I'm guessing that if the eggs are a variety of sizes and colors or something, but maybe um, Evan, if you want to give more clarification on that, but um, any advice for packaging that includes a variety of sizes or colors? Okay, so uh, if you're selling on your farm premises to individual household customers who come to your farm, you can package any which way you want. But if you're selling out in the public eye, including sales to a grocery store, uh, then there are federal requirements on, um, on weight classes. And so your eggs are going to have to be uniform size within the package. Uh, there isn't language about uniform color. So you could have a variety of colors, but you do have to have uniform size. And there are, um, there are, specific weight limits for the different sizes, small, medium, large, extra large, and jumbo, and you have to fit within those thresholds. So, um, so it does require a certain uniformity if you're gonna be selling to a grocery store within each carton. Great. And those are all the questions. Okay. Uh, yep. Cool. So moving on to dairy, which is uh, uh, about the most highly perishable food item there is just about. So uh, we don't talk in a lot of detail about it because you really, really have to just work with an MDA inspector and um, do exactly whatever they tell you to do with dairy. There are inspections of the production side of it as well as the processing and packaging side of it. So it's by no means impossible to set up a uh, on-farm dairy processing plant and sell your product to a grocery store, but uh, you're going to have to be, you know, getting inspected frequently on both the production side and the processing side and working very closely with the Department of Ag. Now, if it's an on-farm facility and you're using only your own milk production from your own farm and not adding any off-farm ingredients, that still falls into that product of the farm category. So you would be able to sell that product to a grocery store without having a license, uh, but that doesn't mean you're exempt from the inspections. You're still going to have all the inspections and a dairy plant permit, um, just not the license. So, you know, 
sometimes the license is actually the, the least and cheapest uh, item to get when there are many facilities and process requirements that you have to follow no matter what. Okay, so value added production. Um, a lot of farmers are interested in making value added products. A lot of grocery stores are interested in buying them. As Ren mentioned earlier, when she was going through the survey results, a lot of grocery stores are interested in carrying jam and jelly products. And uh, it's certainly possible for farmers or others to make those products and sell them to grocery stores. What gets confusing for people is the cottage food law. Minnesota has a cottage food law that allows people to make products like that in their home kitchen without a license. It's an exemption from licensing, but the restriction on that is that those products can only, only, only be sold to the end consumer, that household person who's going to eat the product themselves or serve it in their home or to their family. So um, cottage food cannot be sold to a grocery store. Hard stop, cannot happen. So if someone's going to make a value added product for sale to a grocery store, they're going to have to be licensed to do that. Um, yeah, unless it's, unless it's product to the farm and they're doing some kind of value added processing with no off farm ingredients added. So that can happen if there's a change in the physical state of the product, such as grinding wheat into flour uh, or making strawberries into a like a spreadable fruit with no off farm ingredients added. Um, yeah, that could be a possibility. Uh, or doing some light processing of vegetables like shredding cabbage, peeling and slicing carrots. Uh, cutting up squash into chunks and wrapping it for sale. You know, if you have a huge squash, maybe cutting that into one or two pound chunks, that would be value added with no added off farm ingredients and would fall into product of the farm. Um, so we've got some other examples of value added here. Production of a product in a certain way, such as organic certification, that adds value. Um, whoa. And then, yeah, identity preserved items. So if you've got like a, a specialty corn product, like blue corn, for instance, and you're segregating that from other kinds of corn and selling it as this specialty blue corn, that would be another way to add value. Okay. Yeah, I ran next slide. I think I mashed a few together there, but that's okay. So Examples of processed produce with no added ingredients that would fall into the product of the farm category. So again, when it's product of the farm, no added ingredients, the farmer doesn't need a license to do these things, but they do have to have an adequate facility and follow CGMPs, which are current good manufacturing practices. So if there's a grocery store that's interested in buying some of these processed vegetable types of things to have on the shelves. Um, the grocery store can do that. The farmer can produce it. There would, you know, you'd probably want to have a conversation between the grocer and the farmer about um, how the farmer was doing that process, where they were doing it, making sure that they're using that adequate facility, which is not a home kitchen. So somewhere where there are smooth, cleanable, durable, non-porous surfaces to work on and following those good manufacturing practices around sanitation and worker hygiene and, um, you know, making sure that all packaging and products are stored in a sanitary fashion and that there's a, a control plan to keep rodents out of it and things like that. So adequate facility, again, not a private residence kitchen. Um, any of this product to the farm stuff, 
to be sold to grocery stores, cannot be done in a home kitchen, uh, but it could be done in an on-farm facility. So if the farmer has a packing shed, for instance, and can wall off a section and put in uh, these floors and walls and ceilings of appropriate materials and have uh, stainless steel sinks that they need and an approved source of water and approved septic system, the farmer could do all of these um, processing types of things there on the farm or you know, renting a church kitchen or a town hall kitchen or a community center um, those types of kitchens typically are well enough equipped for this kind of processing with no added ingredients. So when you get into adding off-farm ingredients, that's when things get a little more complicated. So again, cottage food is a way that you can do value added with um, adding off-farm ingredients, but those can't be sold to a grocery store. So cottage food is off the table for the discussion that we're having. But uh, any of those kinds of products can be made under a license. So if you're adding off farm ingredients, if you're making a jam product and you're adding sugar and pectin, um, or if you're making a pickle product and you're adding salt and vinegar, um, any of those types of products where you're adding ingredients, you can do that with a license. And the license type may vary because licenses go by the majority of your activity in a year. So um, if you're someone who is making jam, for instance, and doing some sales to grocery stores and also some sales to individuals at farmers markets, um, you know, it depends on which one is the majority of your sales, whether you would have a retail or a wholesale license. So the license type may vary. Uh, the facility type is going to be dependent on what your inspector requires for the type of product you're making. So the more complex it is, the more potentially hazardous it is, the more facilities requirements you're going to have. And then the FDA food facility registration, um, for sure, if you're wanting to sell across state borders, and then depending on your sources of ingredients, you may need it for sales within Minnesota too. Um, that food facility registration is something that you can do online every two years for the renewal and, and there's not a fee associated with it. It's, um, it's just a registration. Working with a co-packer is a possibility. So someone who would take your recipe and your ingredients and make the product for you uh, in, a, in an approved facility. Um, that's another potential pathway to get product onto grocery store shelves. And there are not a ton of co-packers operating in Minnesota that work with small scale production, but there are a few. There's a list on the Minnesota Department of Agriculture website of some who do that. Uh, and before we go into juice, Jane, there's a couple questions in the chat. Um, we have one question that says, if I use butter bought from a store in one of my products, do I need a license for that product? Uh, um, well, is it a cottage food product? In which case, no, you would need a cottage food registration, but then you couldn't sell it to a grocery store. So if you're using purchased butter in a product that you want to sell to a grocery store, Yes, you need a license because that's an off-farm ingredient. As soon as you add uh, one grain of salt that you didn't mine from your own salt mine on your own farm into a product, uh, you know, then you're out of that product to the farm category and you need a license or an exemption. Um, and then there's another question. Um, is there someone who can walk a farmer through all the steps to get an MDA license? Do you have an example of a farmer who went through this process for a specific product? Um, 
Yeah, so there is the licensing liaison person at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. That's a, a relatively new position that was established to, with the intent of kind of helping farmers through that process of getting a license. Um, for someone to walk you all the way through it, it, you know, it, it depends. Um, if you're looking at actually building a facility, like a non-farm facility to do processing, then you get into county level requirements on zoning and water and septic. And um, it, it really is kind of individual. So, you know, I'm available at MISA to answer kind of those initial uh, just spitballing idea questions. You do kind of want to get out of that spitballing random ideas phase before you go to an inspector because they're going to want very specific answers. So, um, yeah, the they're, you know, extension educators, extension agents in counties are good people to do that kind of initial what if this, what if that type of discussion. Um, yeah, forums like this where you can ask questions, those are helpful. But um, yeah, talking to some other farmers who have done it, that's also a really good idea. Uh, specific examples, Kathy, of, of a farmer who has been through this entire process, of course, you would have to ask that question and that makes all the examples fly straight out of my head. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I do know that there are a number of folks who have gotten licensed to do jam and jelly products. Uh, let's see, there's one at the Grand Rapids Farmers Market who is a vendor who started with cottage food and then uh, had the opportunity to place jam and jelly and some syrup, fruit syrup products in, a, in boutiques. And once you're placing a product in a boutique, then that's an intermediary, right? They're, the boutique owner is then selling the product for you. You are not personally present to sell the product to the customer. So uh, that's where a license is required. And so this vendor did get licensed as a wholesale food processor um, and is operating out of a, a small town community center kitchen and is licensed to operate out of that kitchen. So she's doing that, selling a ton of stuff through local boutiques. Great, and that's all the questions that I see in the chat. And we have about 10 minutes left of our time together. Okay, juice. So juice is a special category. Um, juice is considered really potentially hazardous. There have been a lot of foodborne illness outbreaks associated with apple juice and other fruit juice and vegetable juices. So there's a federal juice HACCP requirement and HACCP stands for hazard analysis and critical control points. And it's like a food safety plan on steroids. Uh, so if a farmer is going to sell juice to a grocery store, that is a wholesale sale and it comes under that federal juice HACCP requirement. So, um, so any grocery store farmer combinations that want to do juice sales, just be aware that you're in that juice HACCP realm um, and, and there are serious food safety requirements and you probably uh, need to look at getting some training on how to develop that HACCP plan and verify it. Uh, and juice sold wholesale must be pasteurized. There is no, there's no option to sell a uh, raw unpasteurized juice product from farmer to grocery store. Bakery, um, a lot of times we think of bakery products as the cottage food products, but bakery can also certainly be done under a license. Uh, again, the facility cannot be a home kitchen. The bakery licenses are issued by Minnesota Department of Ag, and that would be a wholesale food manufacturing license. Um, 
Cottage food does not allow any potentially hazardous things like custards or cheesecakes. But if you're operating under a license and you have the proper facility with refrigeration, you can do those kinds of things under a license. So a licensed baker could be supplying a grocery store with bread and cookies and scones and um, cheesecake and cream filled Danish and things like that. All right, I think that's um, the end of what we have. Um, here we go, go back. Um, so in the, there's a, a checklist that goes by category um, starting on page 15 of the toolkit that can be just a nice like, okay, if this or this or this, depending upon the, yeah, like the, the categories that we've covered, is that something that you might wanna check out? So just plug that here. Um, and so we have had discussion um, throughout the, the presentation, but let's um, first address questions. Uh, let's see, we have a couple more in the chat. Um, if farmers aggregate products for farmer market sales, can third party persons sell on behalf of the farmers or do the farmers have to be present to offer the sale? A third party can sell on behalf of farmers, but that third party has to have a license. So for instance, there are a number of farmers markets in the state that are doing aggregation of multiple vendors products and selling those to um, household consumers and to food businesses. Those farmers markets are licensed either as wholesale food handlers or as retail food handlers, depending again on which, which side is the majority of their sales. Um, and then we have, where does frozen bro bone broth and lard fall on the Minnesota Department of Egg requirements? Yeah, so um, those things are meat products and in order to sell them wholesale to a grocery store, they need to be produced under that continuous inspection of either USDA or Minnesota equal to. So um, potentially a farmer could make those things and sell them to the grocery store, but the farmer would have to have a facility that met the standards of USDA or equal to meat inspection program and they would have to have a, um, either a USDA or an equal to inspector present on every day of operations when they were making their product and their product would get stamped with that USDA um, circle mark of inspection or the, <clears throat> or the Minnesota state outline mark of inspection. Are there other questions? You can feel free to unmute yourself. Um, or putting a question in the chat, some considerations. Is there information that was relevant or surprising to you? Um, how do you think you'll use any of this information? What questions do you have while Jane's here? We have about five more minutes together. Here's another question. Do you need a, an MDA food handler license to sell products with added ingredients such as sausage to customers directly off the farm? Yes, you do. Yep, because once you've got those added ingredients like salt or seasonings or cure, uh, then it's not product to the farm anymore. And yes, you must have a license to sell it. Um, and then a follow-up to the frozen bone broth and lard um, can those products be sold direct to con consumers? Yes, and in that case, there's a little more leeway in um, the processing requirements, and that is a whole other huge area of discussion that we don't have time to get into right now. So uh, I'll put my email in the chat here, and um, if you have specific questions about sales direct to consumers, we can talk about that uh, because you know there's kind of this hierarchy of requirements. The 
the more eyes that your customer has on your farm and on you, um, the fewer requirements you have. But once you're selling to a grocery store, you're putting an intermediate in there, right? It's not direct farm to consumer anymore. There's an intermediary and the products are therefore more anonymous. The, the buyer, the customer doesn't know you, the farmer necessarily doesn't have the opportunity to see your farm, doesn't have the opportunity to discuss your practices with you. They're just buying it at the grocery store like they'd buy anything else at the grocery store. And so, um, so the requirements for those sales to grocery store are significantly higher in some cases than if the customer comes out to your farm. But in the case of meat with added ingredients, yeah, you still need a license. If they're Can adding the ingredients, oh. sorry. No, go ahead. If they're adding the ingredients like um, the cure and they're smoking it, they would need their own HACCP plan as well for that. The processing plant would need that. Yeah. I mean, the unless farmer. They, unless farmer, they do it there. Unless uh, they do it at, them, at their own farm. Um, so farmers are not. Yeah, farmers cannot do that kind of processing on their own farm Got it. of meat products. Meat, meat products are regulated by the federal government by USDA requirements. And mm -hmm. so if farmers want to do on-farm processing and sale of meat products with added ingredients, the farmers need to basically build themselves a custom exempt meat processing plant on their farm and get licensed for that to do that kind of processing of meat. Okay. Thank you. I had a question that just kind of pertains to our breakout room conversation earlier in this session. Um, one of the things we were talking about were the challenges facing both farmers and grocery stores about just, yeah, what we're facing as far as these partnerships. And I'm wondering if, um, I would have liked to hear from more people, like what challenges they're facing. Is there in our future workshops or is there a, is there a, a time cleared out just for a, I mean, not necessarily regional or, but just kind of a clearinghouse of some of the responses to that question. Um, I just think those, those hearing those and, you know, putting on a think cap, so to speak, on how to address some of those would be really interesting. Yeah, so we will definitely share the notes. We had the facilitators try to capture notes from those, the regional conversations. And so we'll share that with everyone. Um, I'll make sure it's linked in the in the email that will go out what the email that you registered with um so the next the next um session that we have is looking at relationships um we'll have a kind of a q a panel discussion with a grocer and a farmer and so that could definitely be a potential to share i've had this experience um like what have you had um to our book to our speakers anya and greg um and I don't know if we have, we don't really have more um, large group time for that type of discussion. That's why we, we, we did it in the small group to hopefully have more people be able to talk. Um, but like I said, I'll definitely share out that information. Um, and I, we could also put together um, like a, a in, the, in the facilitation notes if people wanna add more of their experiences or type out more information, that could be another way to share. Um, large group. Sure, that would be that would be great. I just think in our in our group, um, we didn't all get to share. You know, the the mm -hmm. time was just a little short. So I would just be curious to hear what other what other groups are saying. Um, so thank yeah. thank you. Yeah, we can definitely make that available and an opportunity for people to share more via typing. Um, any last questions? We are at our time. Um, anyone have a burn last burning question? Hearing none. Um, so for workshop two, um, so we do have, okay, so I did, <laughs> there's, so the, your question with the large group time, um, we don't have, but we do have a, a breakout question to talk about a specific, like a very specific challenge or a buying or selling experience that was challenging or exceptional. Um, and that will be about, a, I think a 15 minute breakout. So hopefully if you didn't get to share 
um, in the brainstorming before, this is more asking you about an experience that you've had. Um, looking at pages 18 and 19 more specifically of the toolkit. Um, and then we ask you to bring a food tool. And so you might be wondering, okay, what's a food tool? Well, it can be interpreted in, as creatively as you want to interpret it. Um, it could be utensils, it could be a farming tool that you use regularly, it could be logo wear related to a you know, food business. Um, it could be items used in the store related to food, like a scanner for ordering or a bag or a weekly flyer. Um, so next time, if, and if you forget, that's okay. Well, you can still do introductions with your group. Um, but yeah, we invite you to bring something physical with you um, that's a food tool that you use. Um, any final questions? And go, go ahead and type them in the chat if you want. I'll, this is our last call together. And if not, hearing none, we will see you all a week from now. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks.